This is 4.1.7 work energy power. First, we'll define work done. Work done is the product of force and displacement in the same direction as the force. So work done is the product of force and displacement in the same direction as a force. So this is a distinguishing factor between work done and moment because they're both force times displacement. However, with moment, it's the perpendicular displacement. When it's work done, it's the parallel displacement or the displacement that's in the same direction. This is the reason why, if we analyze gravitational potential energy, it's the same as doing work. So if I lift something up by a certain height, I have done work to lift it. And the same amount of work that I've done to lift it is the same amount of gravitational potential energy that it has. So let's write this down. This is why gravitational potential energy is the same as work done. So if we look at delta EP, so the gain in EP is equal to mg delta H. mg is weight, which comes from F equals to mg. And delta H is a displacement. And both the weight and displacement, these are both vertical. So they're parallel to each other. So both are vertical. Now, to lift an object at constant velocity upwards, say if I was lifting it, or if a motor was lifting it, to lift an object at constant velocity upwards, how much force does the motor or the person lifting need to apply on the mass? It has to be equal to mg. Because if we accelerate it initially, which is almost instantly, the rest of the time when it's moving upwards, it's no longer accelerating. It's moving at constant velocity. So other than the initial point at which you begin to lift, to lift something at constant velocity, you must apply an equal and opposite force to the weight that's trying to pull it down. So that its resultant force is zero. So if I apply mg upwards and something moves upwards, the work done is mg delta h, and the gain in potential energy is also mg delta h. Now, what if there was an angle between the force that was applied and the displacement of the object. In that case, you just have to resolve the displacement into components where one of its components are parallel to the force and only use that. So let's look at an example. So what if there is an angle between force and displacement?
So we'll have some ball. Its displacement is S. And we've applied a force horizontally to it. And there's some angle theta. Now, some component of S is horizontal. Some component of, y, uh, of S is vertical in the y direction. Only the component of S that's in the horizontal direction contributes to the work done by that force. So only horizontal component of S contributes to work done. So if we draw that as a triangle, if we've got S, some angle, S of Y and S of X, where S is equal to the square root of S of X squared plus S of Y squared, we're only taking S of X. And we've got angle theta there. Now, S of X is equal to S cos theta. So the work done is equal to F S cos theta. If it were the case of the force being vertical, then obviously we'd have to calculate it differently. And we might end up with um, F S sine theta, depending on, on the orientation of everything. Now, work done is the same as energy gained or energy transferred. If we take a system where you've got an object that's at some high point that ends up moving to a lower point, then one type of energy transfers to another type. So the simplest one is if we have a frictionless system, then the energy transferred from its gravitational potential energy ends up as its kinetic energy. So if we have H there, and we have something at the start here, and something at the end here, then there's a transfer of energy from its gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy. Therefore, mg delta h is equal to a half mv squared. And then you can work it out. Now, we've assumed here, assuming no friction. Because if there's friction, then you'd have to do work against friction. Now, we're going to look at what happens when we have friction in 4.1.8. So we're going to leave this as it is for now and move on to power. So we said that work done is energy. And power is the rate of change of energy.
Now, remember in the example where I'd said earlier about if I'm lifting something up at constant velocity, how much force would I need to apply? And you guys said mg. During that entire lifting process, I'm not changing the amount of force I'm applying. I'm applying a constant force. And we have constant velocity. Therefore, we have constant power, but we don't have constant energy because energy is power multiplied by time, and as I'm lifting, time is elapsing. So we're storing more and more energy in that system, and I'm doing more and more work the longer I'm lifting it up for. Now we can do this mathematically because we know that power is the rate of change of energy, which means that power is equal to dE dt. Now, I said that work done is energy. So, power is equal to d by dt of F times S. We just said that the force that I'm applying, or the force that a motor is applying, is constant. So let's pull the constant out of the derivative. So it's F dS dt. S is displacement. What's the rate of change of displacement? It's velocity. So the new equation we've got is power is equal to F times V. And now if we feed that back into E equals to PT, so power is FV. If I do F times V times T, what does that give us? It gives us FS because VT is S, assuming there's no acceleration. Let's look at how this would look like in a graph. So, if we had a constant force being applied, We've got F and S. That would give us a line that looks like that. And the area is equal to work done. So simply, it's W equals to F times S in that case. Sometimes, the force might not be constant. The force might be increasing. So we'll do changing force. Now, if you've got a changing force, it's still going to be the area under the graph. But now the area, and again, I'll write down area equals to work done. But in this case, it's going to be equal to a half Fs. So this is going to be used if something is, for example, accelerating. So a motor might accelerate something upwards. Or a motor in a car might be causing the car to accelerate. And since we're on the topic of motors, motors have some efficiency associated with them. So with motors, with inside the motor itself, there's friction, there's losses due to heating, Losses due to vibration. So the energy that you input into a motor will not necessarily give you the output work done on a system that you originally think. So there's efficiency losses here. So we have to go back to 
efficiency that you learned at GCSE and apply it in this case as well. <coughs> so motors lose some energy. So they have efficiency less than 1. And efficiency is equal to useful output over the total input. And this will give us a value between 0 and 1. And then for percentage efficiency, if you wanted it in percent, you could just times that by 100, and that will turn it into percent. That's the end of 4.1.7.